If I may just add, one of the things I whispered to the Reverend was that a shepherd's uh, a duty is to lead a flock, not follow it. And if you saw someone with a blindfold on running towards a cliff, is it rude to yell out to stop? Um, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker now. We are, actually, we are very blessed. Our next speaker was born in the former Soviet Union, and in 1996, after the fall of the Soviet bloc, was ordained a Lutheran pastor. In 2004, he was elected and consecrated the bishop of the, Lutheran, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Lithuania. He, his name is, bear with me, Bishop Reverend Dr. Mindaugas Sabudis. He is an author, theologian, blogger, from, and has a doctorate from the Concordia Theological Seminary. He is the proud father of three children, and he was so kind as to allow me to Americanize his uh, children's names, Jonas, Elizabeth, and uh, close enough, oh, and Paul. <laughs> Please help me welcome all the way from Lithuania, Dr. Reverend Bishop Mindaugas Sabudis. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a big honor and joy and pleasure to participate in this conference. And I am sincerely thankful to Reverend Christopher Thomas Toma for the invitation. And uh, when I told my wife where I am going to talk, she said, what are you planning to say? Because if such speakers as Matt Walsh, as uh, Focus on the Family and before, like Ben Shapiro and others, top speakers, America's, uh, American speakers, made speeches here, what you will tell from our little remote country. But anyway, I will try to share as Christian to Christian people. Some experience, maybe what, uh, what can be actual for you, if not now, but maybe tomorrow. But some experience which helped us to survive many centuries and many decades of persecution. So first of all, I am from Lithuania. And I am absolutely not a fan of PowerPoint. <laughs> I re really I try to, I, I, I tried to avoid in all, uh, in all circumstances. But for the beginning, I think PowerPoint will be helpful for me and for you. And it is because of one st story which, and event which took place 27 e years ago. During one reception, the guests from different regions had been welcomed. After their region or country was mentioned, they raised their hand, and the rest of participants greeted them with applause. Suddenly, we heard such a welcome. Welcome our guests from Balkans. And nobody raised their hands. It was silence. And then we hear again, welcome our guests from Balkans. And then again we hear uncomfortable silence and somebody told silently to the host of event, maybe from Baltics. Then the host said, welcome our guests from Baltics, then we were we three from Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, we raised our hands and we are welcome. So we can see in the map, uh, up is Baltic, three Baltic countries uh, at the Baltic Sea and down to see in the neighborhood of uh, Italy here, the Balkan countries. So I am from Baltics, <laughs> from, uh, from one of three Baltic countries from Lithuania. And there, there are some, uh, there will be some very fast, short facts illustrated by slides. And uh, there are two purposes. One, to introduce myself a little bit, but 
it, it is one more purpose which I, which I will explain later. So I was born in Lithuania, and you can see Lithuania is a land with borders, two friendly nations, Poland south and Latvia north, and two very uh, unfriendly countries, Russia and Belarus, Belarus. And, uh, but I was born that time in uh, the family of Soviet officer in the United, in the Soviet Union, and, but he was, he is a man of Lithuanian nationality and a nurse. But since I have all my, since my childhood, I was a member of, uh, uh, of Lutheran Church, and here, if you can see the map of the Soviet Union, it, it was pre previous map, but it's okay. Now, uh, previous map, and you can see the whole uh, Ukraine and tiny, tiny little, little small countries in the, in the north. And then, thank you, the next slide. In the Middle Ages, uh, Lithuania was the largest country in Europe, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. It was a warlike country that fought against the invasion of German Teutonic Knights from the west and also in, invaded and defended its eastern borders from Slavic uh, tribes and other people. The territory of modern Belarus and most of territory of contemporary Ukraine were a part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. These countries have always, always been connected with us and uh, thinking about present situation, so for us, even Ukraine is, uh, is a remote country physically from, for us, but psychologically, spiritually, it's, it's very close for us, so we are, we are very sensitive to what is happening there. Lithuania, Lithuanians are the last baptized nation in Europe. And you can see the uh, picture frescoes in Strasbourg Protestant Church, but it was made, of course, in the Middle Ages. Maybe it's not seen very well, but, uh, but uh, the, the name of this is the Nations of Europe Marching Towards Cross. And up there, the first nation are Germania, Germans. The fourth nation is Anglia, England. And the, uh, and the next picture, and the last nation you can see, Lithuania. It's my country, the last Christian nation and you, in, uh, in Europe. So if, you, well, if, if you'd like to see the last uh, representative of pagan the last pagan nation of, of Europe, it's me. So it's, uh, <laughs> even though I'm carrying the name, uh, pagan name, Mindaugas, which I, which I know for, for Americans is the, not the most easiest name to pronounce, but this name uh, is, the, is the name of the first and only king of our country. And why this name was given to me? It was because of silent opposition during Soviet time. Parents tried at least in such a way to fight against communist occupation to give old national names to their children. So it is related, it is, it is always related with pre contemporary story, history. Since 1569, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was created. It was a big country which existed, uh, existed until final, final partition among Russia, Prussia, and Austria out of three divisions. And in uh, 1759, completely was. Uh, 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 completed uh, her, its existence. And uh, the greater part of Lithuania became, became a, a part of R Russian Empire. There have been a number of uprisings against the Russian Tsar Empire in late 18 and all 19 centuries. And the one that happened before the collapse of state is uh, directly related uh, with your country. And you can see two monuments, uh, one monument, monument on, the, uh, on the left uh, and monument of the right. Monument of the right stands 
in Chicago. And uh, he is also, this man is hero in Poland and Lithuania because he was fighter against Tsar Empire, but he's also hero in the United States. He's Tadeusz Kosciuszko. He was the, uh, the in the fighter of, your, uh, in, of colonial army for your independence. So we have the links of brave people who fight it for freedom. And, uh, and uh, through the 19th century, Lithuania was oppressed by Russian empire. People were enslaved in accordance with the Russian tradition. The Lithuanian language, which is not Russian language at all, is even not similar. We, we are two nations with uh, Baltic language, we and Latvians. It was nearly forbidden and, uh, and uh, books, publishing of books were prohibited. And then in, on 19, uh, 1918, the independence of Republic of Lithuania was declared and then more than 100 years ago, Lithuania was again independent country. In the 1940, the uh, communist Soviet occupation, first occupation appeared. And then in the beginning of, uh, in the middle of uh, 1941, the two allies, Soviet Union and Hitler, Germany uh, started the war between each other. And of course, one of the largest tragedies of this, of this war was a Holocaust in our country. And we had 200,000 uh, Jewish people, our co-citizens co and our neighbors were, have been exterminated, they were killed. And uh, he, uh, even though my grandfather was killed in, uh, also in Nazi German prison of that time, but anyway, I feel as being Lithuanian, as walking in the streets, seeing the houses where those people lived, and uh, you see, you can imagine the history in our country lasted 600 years. We had history of Jewish nation, and we were always a neighborhood. Jewish, uh, then uh, since Reformation, Lutherans, Catholics, Orthodox, of course, uh, they were neighborhood relations. They are not uh, every time nice, but uh, they were nice relations. And that immediately everything disappeared. And I am, as Christian, I still care, kind of uh, feeling of repentance and big pain. What and also, it is a perfect story to teach our children how immediate things can change. And your neighbor can be your enemy just in one day. And then your neighbor can be your killer just in one day. This is what we need to keep in mind that this is a very important story uh, to learn for all of us how we need to to protect ourselves and each other, and to be very careful what is happening around us, because tragedy never comes in one day. It always develops until, until the certain point when it, when, uh, when it explodes. And then, after, immediately after the Second World War, uh, yeah, in 1944, Red Army was approaching Lithuania. Then hundreds of thousands of Lithuanians left Lithuania for, uh, for Germany and then to the USA, Canada, Australia, Great Britain. Because they were afraid of the communist terror, which, with, uh, which they already tasted uh, from 1940s. And uh, they started, uh, and the terror started immediately after Soviets came to Lithuania again and 100 30,000 innocent people, mostly women and, ch and children, were deported to Siberia and other countries, and many of them died. Many of them were kill raped, killed, and humiliated inside Lithuania. But immediately after the Second World War, uh, anti-communist resistance started, and started with a round of 30,000 people, you can, uh, our nation is about 3 million. And 30,000 people immediately formed the armed resistance and went to forests. Men and women 
nicknamed from our, in our nation, it's in positive way nicknamed the Forest Brothers, waged an armed struggle against the Soviets. The active form of partisan struggle lasted eight years until 1953. Many died. They pre preferred to die in, in battle than to live in a slavery. And this is, I was, and, and then, after the defeat of the armed opposition, the Cold War in Lithuania began and worldwide began. The Soviet Union continued to build socialism and, move, uh, and to move toward communism, which was predicted, and we were learned in school, that communism will start uh, in the year 2000. As we were taught in the school, the time is coming when everything in the shops will be for free. But, <laughs> nice, nice promise. It was a uh, year 2000, so it's not, it, it didn't happen, I think. But at the same time, the shelves of shops and stores were absolutely, totally empty. Then, in the 1990, uh, on, in 1990s, after a so-called singing revolution, the independence of Lithuania was declared and Lithuania became an became independent country and today we are members of NATO and of uh, European U Union and all, all possible structures and we are democratic country as much uh, as with the same problem of democracy as you face here so we learn from you how to protect civic society very carefully because your experience is, is uh, huge and we, uh, we, we have a lot of to learn. Uh, con uh, concerning the religion, Lithuania is a, Cath a Catholic country with around 79% uh, of Roman Catholics, 9% uh, of uh, Russian Orthodox, and 0.6% of Lutherans. So anyway, we are in some way in very honorable place, even, even being very small. But uh, before the Second World War, we had 200,000 people. After Second World War, 20. So we lost everything before, during, and after war. War, deportations, persecutions, and uh, migration. And we lost about 90% of everything, buildings, pastors, members. And uh, Lutherans were exceptionally persecuted. I will tell a little bit later about that, but, uh, but uh, we were uh, allowed to pray only in remote areas from, uh, uh, in big distance from big cities and all churches in big cities have been closed. And you, see, you can see some of the pictures where our churches were completely destroyed by Soviets or they were turned into barns into granaries, uh, 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 into leather manufacturers and all uh, cinemas, uh, uh, basketball gyms, swimming pools, everything what you can imagine. So, so all what, uh, what was Lutheran was humiliated and all, of course Catholics, Roman Catholics had their own persecution very tough persecution, but their ch church structure remained. Our church structure was nearly destroyed completely. And uh, uh, after 1990s, the church activities were restored. The major majority of church buildings have been re uh, restored and church structures like youth work, youth camps, social activities were again started to work as it was. But what can I state today after, after 30 years of an independence and of freedom that in the very beginning of independence we thought that the walls, the buildings is the most complicated task of pastor and bishop and of uh, church members. For bishop, of course, the walls is one of the most complicated because I receive daily calls about the holes in the roofs of problems in, in basements from different churches, so it's, but it's, it's not the most complicated. Because 
it's not so difficult. Even you have very problematic church building, very much destroyed church building or damaged, you can restore it. But what I can say 100% that's much, much more difficult to restore the heart and the soul of humans. It's not enough to have money and fundraising. It needs a lot of patience. And we need to be patient then to each other as God is patient to us because it needs a lot of time. Because when each, even a little damage, it uh, leads people and follows people during their life and it's very difficult to bring people to bring people back to Christ, to repentance, to hope, when this hope was, uh, was annihilated. So this, is, uh, this part is the end of my PowerPoint. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and uh, uh, my special thanks is uh, to you today, because I am, of course, you have uh, political agenda in the United States of America, you have own agenda. I am citizen, I'm a citizen of another country. And we have also different issues and, and very similar issues. But about the past, about the Soviet time, I, I am sincerely very thankful to American people, to you and maybe to your parents and to your grandparents that Lithuania uh, also, uh, as other two Baltic countries, Latvia and Estonia, the America, the America had never accepted the occupation of Baltic countries. Never, ever. And the occupation was never, ever recognized. And that was during my lifetime and during my childhood. I, 15 years I lived in, uh, in, uh, Soviet, in Soviet occupation, but I remember this daily appreciation to people of America because, and the strong position for freedom of uh, American government. That even we were, uh, there were no signs of our uh, countries. Your, uh, Soviet army, communism regime, uh, KGB, and all this stuff you, you, you have heard. But despite of that, America said, and also UK said, those countries are independent. And even during the whole Soviet time, we had our uh, representatives in Washington and other, other places. So that is, uh, and a very important part of my life, of my story is the radio, the radio voice of America. That was very specific hour in each home, in each, uh, in each place when people Elder fathers and grandfathers, they sit it with the radio receivers. And you know, the, uh, the Soviets tried to, to, to make troubles not to hear the voice of America, but we heard they were anthems, anthems, sometimes two meters high, and with troubles we heard all the news in our Lithuanian language, and this, this Yankee Doodle and America, America, the melodies, intros and outros, I know since uh, from my childhood, maybe with our the, with the first uh, church songs. So this was the voice, and this was uh, the, the voice of freedom and voice of hope during the Iron Curtain. Do I have time? And, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, because I'm, uh, please tell me if I'm too, 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 too long. So when I'm sharing uh, this story, why I am doing this, it's one thing to, to talk, to share my experience, but another uh, thing is related also with you, with each of you. When, when I tell, my, uh, tell you about my present and past, uh, I speak about language, country, church, also faith, it is always part of me. It is what we call, it's my identity. And when you see me, all the story, 
It lives not in the it lives not in the in, in the books in the bookshelves of uh, books of history. It lives here and here. And I am sure each of you, absolutely, you have the similar story of your family, of country, of your family experience, of your country experience, of your of your personal experience, and this experience, it is what you are. And this is why it is important. Because now we live in time when there are doubts, what is human being? And what uh, most often we hear that hum human being is a kind of uh, accidental collection of cells, or maybe of genes, but we are not accidental collection of, of, of cells or parts of human parts. We are human beings with our history, with our roots. And uh, we have different stories, but as Christians, we have one identity which makes us united and where I feel we are one with you. And this is, this is identity to be Christian, to be children of God. It is also identity. It's deep identity because when I'm Christian, a lot of things starts to live in my heart and to be actual. Adam and, and Eve, they are not distant, uh, distant heroes of, uh, of old ancient apples. They are my forefathers. Abraham is not only the uh, story of Moses with exile, or oh, uh, King David with his psalter and with his psalms is part of me and the pro promised Messiah is, I, I live with uh, this, pro I think about uh, the nation of Israel and how they hear this promise. And then uh, fields of Bethlehem, it's part of my story and of your story. And also the cross of Calvary and also the day of uh, the morning of resurrection, the empty, uh, empty, empty tomb, and also the last, the day of last judgment, judgment, Kyrie eleison, be gracious to us on that day. But this is part of us. It is not, and uh, there are a lot of theories. What is, what is identity? It's from a, from a Latin word, idem, it's samenessness. I am s someone, uh, in the, uh, with whom or, or with someone or with me. And there are some theories whether identity is created by elites or whether it's inherited by uh, when we are born or it's completely, I don't know. But it is what lives in us. And this what unites us. And this is where we are called to protect our identity. And if, you, uh, if, if we think about what is happening when we are when we, uh, when we have uh, themes about uh, gender issues, all, all different abortions and everything, we, we know all, all, all these schedule of, of topics. It's always fight against persons, against families, against church, against nation's identity. And uh, why identity is so important? Because God, is God of identity because he's open and he identifies himself like to Moses in the burning bush. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God reveals himself. And then Israel, remember him. And they repeat always, I am the Lord, Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. And in the Pesach meal, in the Sedek meal, Jew, many Jewish families, they are doing the same as they did many centuries ago. There, were, there are three cups. When we read the Gospel of Luke, we see that God, uh, Jesus blessed one cup and then the second cup, but it was in the middle, one more cup in families. And it was dedicated there before, to, before drinking this cup, there was one ritual. The youngest of family asked to the older, elder of family, 
what does it mean what we are doing now? And he explained the whole story of, of uh, Egypt, desert, and of freedom. This is how from generation to generation the identity was transferred and this transferred until now. And when Jesus says, he never speaks in, in, in mystery words. He speaks the most beautiful words we hear. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the wine. I am the alpha and omega. And then when Philip asked, can you show us Father? Well, Jesus answered, if you saw me, you saw Father. And God revealed himself in Jesus' baptism and as the Trinity, in his, uh, in his uh, transfiguration and on the cross. When naked, he was killed for us. And this is very different how devil reveals itself. In the garden of Eden, he revealed himself as serpent. And also during temptation of, uh, of Jesus Christ, devil promised something he cannot do. He's a liar. And when Jesus asked uh, during the exorcism, uh, he asked, what is your name? What he answered, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. So this is identity of God with open heart, with love. And identity of devil is always foggy. There's foggy promises, there's foggy names, a lot of names, a lot of mysteries, a lot of magic. So it's a huge difference. And we as Christians, we have our identity because God promised everyone who accepted him he gave power to be child of God. This is your identity. This is your identity in this earth and the, in the life to come. And you must protect it. <laughs> and uh, in Revelation we read, I will also give the person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. And why it is so hidden to the world, and why the stone is so precious to us, and what name is written there? The name of Jesus. And this is we are the owners of this precious stone in our heart of this name where salvation comes. In the Middle Ages, the, uh, one book was written, uh, uh, theologically it's questionable anyway, but, uh, but uh, the idea was pretty good. Imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ by uh, Thomas Kempis. And uh, this, uh, the idea is very good because with someone, you are friends, you become similar to your friends. If you try to imitate someone, you will be similar to, uh, to someone you imitate. And, and if you see Christ as your Lord, and if you see his word as truth, not as recommendation, as absolutely truth, you go to imitate him. But if you hear the word of snake, has God said, and to this, the word of snake goes through history until now, and, uh, and Reverend uh, Christopher Thoma mentioned the, the, the same I, I wanted to mention too, that he goes, had God said, maybe it's not true. Maybe you're not creature of God. Maybe you are just accident. Maybe there is no God. Or maybe what we, hear, what we read in the Bible is old tale, but there are other religions with his own wisdom. And, uh, and so on and so on. And this is then, if we hear to this voice, we will be like those who speak that. But they don't speak 
because there are no words in uh, the in the realm of devil. And a wonderful psalm I want to share with you. It's Psalm 115 and 135 is also similar. But to keep in mind, it's very important. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Your God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And this is important. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. All who trust in them will be similar to them. You have good tradition and opportunity to speak and to fight for your freedom in very open forms. We, know, we as Lithuanians, as, as Lutherans, we not always had this opportunity. And there are, I will tell some, some stories of our past which helped us survive. And maybe when you will see in your job, in your occupation, even sometimes in your family, you will be forced to be silent. Maybe something will be very useful to remember for you from our experience because this is what really works, because our church survived. And first of all, we had the movement called Pietism in, uh, in Europe, and uh, it's theologically is, is rather complicated for us, for Lutherans. In many cases, so uh, I, I am not the biggest fan of theology of Pietism, but it's a movement uh, with, uh, with a task to encourage people to pray more, but one positive, positive moment from this movement we can observe, the Lithuanian Lutherans were taught to read Bible, to have a hymnal, and to read sermon books at home. Usually it was once per week and Friday, according to the words of Luther that each house father, so elder of home, must collect family and to examine from or to teach from catechism. It happened so. People learned how to make devotions. And this is positive part of this influence. Negative is probably the, the declining role of sacraments. But in, in Lithuania, the, uh, uh, it was not so, so tough as in, in, uh, in other countries. But anyway, and this is what happened. Then people started to have additional family devotions, even instead of services, when services were remote and winter, when you, couldn't, you cannot reach uh, your church from farm, or after services, evening. And that was it, uh, generation after generation, it, it, it became a praxis of family, Christian family life. And when I mentioned after 1944, when the, our church structure was totally destroyed, from nearly, nearly 17 pastors, so only six remained, and so on and so on. Church didn't function. What happened? Devotions at home continued. Father or mother, grandfather or grandmother, uncle or aunt, they had a Bible, hymnal, and collection of sermon book postile. And they used it. And this is how our church survived. And what happened in 1960s, 1970s, this, tradi this, uh, this tradition was a little slowly, slowly neglected. In some families, like in my family, in my wife's family, it remains unt until, until, uh, until now, but it's very seldom. And many people, 
they were not uh, communists. We, don't, we didn't have uh, devoted communists in our land. So it was, uh, everybody was critical, but the people wanted to just to live somehow possible comfortable life, minimal comfortable, and to, to keep themselves in Soviet structures. And, and many people became to be distant from the church. Sometimes because, because of real distance from the church and sometimes because of their activities. And when it happened after 1999, Church were opened. Services started. And, there, and that, that was very fashionable to be Christian at that time, not anymore now, but at that time in the 1990s, you are, it, was, it was good as, as to be communist two or three years ago and now, then to be Christian now, it was new fashion and let's go to the church. Everybody were in the church, all former communists and KGB officers. They were very de devout people then. But um, shortly, but then disappeared. But many of those people returned to the church. And what they discovered, they came back home. Because the, the word they heard, the song they sang, the sermon that was uh, preached, they had everything the same in their grandmother's, grandfather's home. The seed was planted. And even though 20 or 30 years they were absent from the church, they returned not as, as strangers. You know, when you don't know, especially when our churches with liturgy, it's not easy sometimes. You don't know where to, where to kneel, where to stand. Where to, for, for some people, it's, it's, it's complicated. But no, they felt at home. And this is important for protecting identity of your children and grandchildren. Plant a seed. You don't know what fruits will come, whether it will come, but plant a seed with hope. Plant the seed of the holy word with hope. Another, my story. In the Soviet Union, there were three types of young communist organizations. The smallest one, uh, for the smallest one, for little one, they are called Little Octoberists. That means uh, rem remembrance of 1917 October uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Those were from seven to nine years old, then Pioneers, communistic pioneers, for, and then Komsomol, young communist. And uh, I was in, in two first of them. Because, because you know, they, are, they were all, only seldom who refused to, to go. Even we never believed what is there. But maybe some believe. And little Octoberists, the primary school, two primary grades, I think. There were seven, and uh, that time we started with seven, so seven, eight, nine, two, three grades. You know how we were called, how we were named? We were named the grandchildren of Lenin. You know who is Lenin. He is leader of Bolshevik Revolution, the worst, one of the worst, I think, inhabitants of, of hell. And, uh, and do you know what song we learned? I, I, it's, it sounds in Lithuanian, it's, uh, in poetic form. Uh, I, could, I could not find a way to translate in this way in English, but anyway, the meaning is, we little, uh, I am very proud that I am an Octoberist, that I, I am a little Lenin's grandson. Can you imagine, it's like, until this time, until recent years, I forgot this story. But when I observed what is happening in my country, in Europe, in the United States, I remember it is exactly the same. It is attack to identity. You as little child, you are not grandson of your grandparents. You are not a member of your family. You are not something else. You are grandson of, of this, you know, where Lenin still, uh, 
his, his stuffed body he still lives in the Red Square in, in the, the Kremlin. I, I saw him in uh, 1889. It's right before independence, I, I was eager to, I thought it will be the first and the last time to see him, so, so, uh, so I, I, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough story, you know, and don't you feel the similar, similarity of present day with children? Your parents, who are they? Who are your grand, grandparents? They are old fashioned people. They are religion fanatics. They are, they are conservative fanatics. They, are, they, they, are, they don't understand the, rea the reality of life. Come to us. With us, you will have always joy and pleasure. We will help you to find your real identity. We will help you to castrate you yourself or to kill you, uh, to kill your child in your womb. Come to us. And this is attack against, against uh, uh, individual identity. It's uh, the, the end. Yes. <laughs> uh, so like, like, like the song. I had one, one story from present time, but I, but I will be very short in two minutes. You got it. It, may, it, it, was, it was, I was prepared for longer, sorry, but uh, I had, uh, Two, two minutes. Uh, we have discussion of so-called Istanbul Convention in Europe and in Lithuania. In Europe, every country signed. Istanbul Convention is the, the simila similarity of American Equality Act. And there is beautiful document, and the ma many countries try to sign. It's against violin, uh, a document against violence against women. Everything is beautiful, but the one sentence is that we must fight against uh, the uh, gender neutral identity and to fight against all stereotypes. Then we Christians, we asked what is that and uh, members of my church said we need to respond and, uh, and I have pro uh, broadcasted one, one hour, 50 minutes uh, live broadcasting in YouTube and YouTube was, uh, and I was banned, banned there because of, because of hate speech and I moved to another resource, and I was uh, not, didn't, not banned it there, but I was uh, investigated by many of our institutions. And the, bigger, uh, the most uh, interesting institution was, uh, was that I was four months investigated by, uh, by uh, department, uh, English name, uh, by inspector of journalistic ethics. I, I never dreamed that I'm a journalist, but I know, now my new identity, you know. But one, those who offended me and who, 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 who wrote complaints against me, they published one brilliant answer from the, the institution called European, European, European Foundation of Human Rights. The, uh, it was the response to complain about my hate speech, and they they, they wrote something like, like that. I have here, but I, but I will not find it soon. soon. And it's, they said, yes, we we agree that the, the bishop language is too strong, tough, but unfortunately, we must say that it is not hate speech. Unfortunately, it is not hate speech. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, and may God bless you. Yeah, I didn't mean to sneak up on him like that. It probably remind him of the KGB. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick uh, about a 10-minute break. We're going to be starting back sharp at 11 a.m. For our next speaker, feel free to use the facilities and visit our visiting organization.